So welcome, 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 Lindsay. We greatly appreciate your leadership as always. And as always, we begin things by acknowledging our creator, the original stewards, the various lands we're on. We acknowledge our ancestors and all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We acknowledge all our elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we share, build, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. So Lindsay, please introduce yourself to our listeners and viewers and tell us a bit about your remarkable work. Thank you so much, Victor. Um, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here. So my name is Lindsay Wallace. And uh, in my day job, I'm the Senior Vice President of Strategy and Impact at an organization called MEDA, which is the Mennonite Economic Development Associates. And MEDA has been around for 70 years. We're actually celebrating our 70th anniversary uh, next year. And we support, uh, we do impact investing and agricultural development programs um, globally. Uh, about half of our programs are currently in Africa, but we also work in Latin America as well as in Asia. And broadly what we focus on is uh, growing um, agricultural focused uh, businesses through investment uh, and supports and, and really help to uh, help them grow scale, create decent work opportunities. Uh, and Mita is unique in that it was an investor almost before it worked in, I guess, what you'd call traditional development work. And investment has been at the heart of our uh, of our journey of of certainly what we we love to do. And it's very much about working with a group of really great entrepreneurs and and helping them, supporting them, and partnering with them um, so they can uh, can grow and scale their businesses. And uh, when I'm not doing that, I'm also the chair of the board of an organization called CAFID, the Canada Forum for Impact Investment and Development. And what we are is a group of uh, organizations that are very much interested in growing and scaling the volume and the value of uh, SDG focused uh, investment from Canada to emerging markets. And I've been on the board for about uh, three years. I, I'm now chair as of uh, July. And uh, we're about 80 different uh, organizations and individuals. And we come together, share information and uh, network and look for opportunities to, uh, to work also with other organizations to really grow and scale and address some of the barriers. That's remarkable. Thank you so much for um, all the remarkable work and leadership that you just shared in your candor and transparency. My next question is, what inspires you most about your work currently? Um, for me, it's certainly working and having really great discussions with the entrepreneurs that we, we work with, um, as well as those that support them. Because we tend to work in the um, agribusness, um, they're in agribusinesses, we work with entrepreneurs who are often doing some kind of aggregation or processing. Uh, for example, I just recently um, went, was in Tanzania and met with some entrepreneurs working in the dairy value chain. Um, and uh, Joy uh, runs an organization called Med Food um, just outside of um, Arusha. And she is purchasing uh, milk from a number of um, actually pastoralists nearby. She takes it, processes it, makes the most delicious yogurt I've ever had. And part of what we did in our work with her was, was helping her to get some equipment, address some of the cold chain challenges, um, help uh, get access to financing. Um, we also set up some cold chain and uh, cold milk deposit centers so that uh, the, the folks that are bringing their milk, the raw milk, it, it can stay, um, stay secure and making sure that, um, you know, food standards are, are met and so on. So I really love uh, hearing from the entrepreneurs, working with them. They're very inspirational. Everyone's got great ideas. And so just thinking, how can we collaborate to really help them to, to grow and scale? Because particularly... Um, you know, in, in rural areas, agriculture is so important. It's the, the backbone and it's it's really critical to um, uh, to addressing poverty and understanding some of the challenges. So I really love kind of going in and speaking and meeting with everybody and, and working, um, you know, with others on, on our team to really think through, OK, what are some of the, the opportunities? You know, entrepreneurs are are the same the world over access to finance is an issue how do you connect different parts along the value chain share information marketing 
Um, so it's it's really quite uh, quite inspirational, and uh, yeah, that's that's really what drives me. That's incredible. What challenges and barriers do you face in your work, and how are you and your team working to overcome some of these challenges and barriers? Well, well, that's a great question, and I think I mean certainly from the the work that we do at Mita, I think part of the challenge is that. Um, you know, there, there's certainly just not enough both funding, but it's not just funding, but it's also um, investment interest. And, and I'd say that's one of the challenges that both CAFID and Mita face as impact investors working in emerging markets. There's still such a perception and barrier, I think, particularly in Canada about, you know, what some of the possibilities are for investment in emerging markets. And I think there's still also very much of a, a charity kind of mindset. And, you know, I'd love to see that kind of be evolved and, and uh, a greater recognition of um, and a greater understanding of what the true risk actually is. So one of the unique things that Mita does is, you know, we will be implementing an agricultural development program funded by uh, Global Affairs Canada or uh, the USAID. And then we invest alongside those programs. You know, often it's with a local financial institution that needs some um, uh, you know, that we work with to encourage them to lend to the local farmers or the local um uh, SME that we're working with, but, and, and, you know, I mean, the, the investments are challenging, you know, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, but that's, you know, that's life in the, in the finance sector. But what I find is just this incredible misperception about risk, um, and risk of emerging markets. And, and that's certainly something that we've seen, you know, at CAFID, I know we feel it, uh, at Mita, and I think it's also a, particularly Canadian challenge, you know, I think we've got a very, very conservative uh, financial sector. And the more that we all can collectively do to demonstrate how others are doing it, how it's it's a possibility, um, I think the better off that, you know, we'll all be. Uh, one example is, um, you know, the, the Danish government, their um, development finance institution set up an SDG fund and the Danish pension funds are, are investing in it. And it's working closely with um, the DANITA, which is the Danish international development um, arm uh, of the Danish government. And so they're able to actually use some of the tools that we've been trying to use in Canada, but we're not quite there yet. And so I think there's a lot of examples. They're investing right into uh, innovative solar program or solar um, companies in um, emerging markets, agricultural companies. And they're able to do so in a way that uh, really achieves the SDG. So it's ESG focused investing. It's, it's very clearly impact driven. But there's there's pension fund interest. We're not there yet with uh, in Canada. I think Fund Action is the only pension fund that has any uh, um, you know true impact investment in emerging markets. So yeah, that was a very long answer to I think uh, one of the biggest barriers overall is just the the old mindsets of many in the existing financial sector, particularly here in Canada. No, I really appreciate, once again, your transparency and your candor around all of this. Um, we've we've had these conversations off and online. So uh, once again, it's, it's just really important that we, we raise these these concerns, especially when we talk about retail products in the Canadian markets. Um, so, so I'm grateful. I'm grateful for your leadership and diligence as always. Um, my next question is, do you have a set of key priorities right now in your work? So certainly, I mean, at, at CAFID, uh, one of the things we're continuing to do is to kind of increase the knowledge, awareness of, and interest in SDG-focused impact investing. Um, and I think we do that a lot through, well, a couple of ways. One, we've set up a, a couple of communities of practice. So we have a re recently, well, I guess it's been around about a year, but we recently shared out some case studies of our gender lens investing uh, work. So there were uh, five different organizations that contributed to show how different approaches to really integrating gender into impact investing. Um, we're also continuing to share examples of how other OECD or other countries are actually able to um, advance uh, impact investing and 
I guess, demonstrate ways of overcoming some of the barriers that are often spoken about in terms of, uh, you know, fiduciary duty or riskiness and, and so on. And and because I, I do think if we're able to show how um, some of these approaches are being addressed elsewhere, um, I think we'll have, uh, you know, hopefully it'll help at least show that that it is possible. At Mita, uh, we recently launched, um, well, I, I guess it's six months ago, um, the MasterCard Foundation Africa Growth Fund, which is a uh, $200 million uh, fund of funds. It's a blended finance fund, and it's really focusing on um, supporting uh, gender diverse uh, fund managers um, and investment vehicles across the continent. Uh, and so one of the things that we're trying to do is, is one, to replicate this initiative, but also to shift the conversation on where funds should be domiciled. Often with a lot of um, impact investment private equity funds, there's a real sense that things need to be uh, based in you know, Luxembourg or Delaware or in, or in other jurisdictions. And um, we're trying to explore a little bit about what some of the barriers are, because the unique thing about the Africa Growth Fund is that the funds must all be domiciled in Africa. And so I think there's um, a lot of opportunities and to also think about how do we engage with the local um, uh, capital markets, the local uh, institutional investors on that. So yeah, a whole variety of things, but broadly under the umbrella of really trying to increase awareness of and increase more capital into uh, SDG focused um, impact investing into emerging markets. And do you find it challenging to engage local capital markets and institutional investors in terms of those processes based off of regulatory frameworks or? So we're, we actually have a study underway right now that's uh, it's separately funded by the MasterCard Foundation. Um, we are there are challenges and barriers, and it's um, it really varies based on geography. Of course, Mauritius is, you know, been the most um, I guess successful. Um, you know, when there's, it's going to look different in, in different places. I know, certainly, I think Ghana has also been taking a lead in trying to encourage some of the DFIs to uh, look at co-investing more with some of their local pension funds. But there's there's a long way to go, and it, it really it really varies. I think Rwanda has also done a, a fair bit. Um, you know, I think this is something that with the Global Steering Group on Impact Investing and some of these other, you know, Impact Invest Africa and, and certainly other geographies, there's a lot of opportunities to kind of share lessons and, and learn. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, especially um, we, we both sit on the NAB um, task force together on Impact Investing in Canada. And I think the GSG has definitely paved um, a path for these types of investments and funds of fund development. So once again, thank you for your candor and, and, and all that you're sharing to help um, build communities of practice and your thought leadership and practitionership. We just really appreciate you. Um, so my next question is, how do you feel about the future of impact investing in Canada and internationally? So I'm broadly positive, I'd say. I think, um, I don't know, I'm probably going to get in trouble from this, but uh, I'm, I'm probably more positive internationally than I am uh, about Canada. I, I don't know what we need to do to... Um, I mean, so let me take two steps back. One, momentum is continuing to head into the, the direction of more impact. I know the Responsible Investment Association just released their um, latest uh, report. So the Canadian Responsible Investment Association, there is a greater interest in impact. So we're seeing an upward trajectory, although it is, you know, in the ESG in general, starting to, to flatline a little bit. I think we have more to do to really think through what does impact mean and how do we make sure that not everybody's just going to slip, you know, slapping an impact label on to, to call it an impact fund. Um, but there's work underway to, to do that. Um, I think generally we're seeing a lot of interesting innovation happening in emerging markets themselves with greater mandates on ESG investing. And I think that will also help to to grow and increase it globally. Um, but, you know, I think we need to, again, either demonstrate ideas or, 
you know, one example that I'm always struck by is, you know, I guess it's fairly famous that, you know, the one of the big pension funds here in Canada invested in, in the FTX crypto market. And because I think a lot of people were interested, it was a bit of a trend. Um, I think, you know, it, it, hindsight's 2020 and the due diligence might not have been where it needed to be. Uh, I don't know. I can't quite say, but um, uh, there's a willingness to take risk, right? So it, we know that it's there. So how do we kind of shift the discourse and and really think through, okay, what are some of those opportunities? And so I think there's a, for those of us that are very keen on engaging with the maybe more traditional um, capital, because we need it. I mean, the Canadian impact investing into emerging markets is a is a drop, tiny, tiny drop in the overall uh, volume of uh, Canadian um, both impact funds as well as investment funds. And so, you know, we'd love to see that that grow and scale. And so part of it is sharing information, demonstrating that it's possible. You know, we need to find one or two leaders, and there's a number of conversations underway with the in the pension community that that I think will really help with that. Um, and then we also need to, I think, as organizations work together. None of us can do this alone. So how do we collaborate to uh, to address those common challenges? And you know, certainly, I know through my work at CAFID and your work at TIP, it's been fantastic to collaborate on that. There are other organizations that I think need to be also part of the conversation. Um, certainly, the um, Responsible Investments Association, Cap Finance, um, you know, more of uh, Sednet, all these different groups. So I think we need to see how do we work together to really try to collectively grow the grow the space. Um, I'd also love to see a retail product here in Canada. There's nothing that will shift the market more than having um, people go into their local bank or, you know, to say, hey, I'd like to I'd like to do this. You know, it, it, I can think of about six or seven different European countries. If I went into a bank, I could say I'd like to invest in microfinance in South America or solar in you know, Africa, and there are choices and options to do that. And, um, you know, they may not, the, the returns vary, some of them are very good, but there's very safe, secure ways of doing that. We don't have that in Canada. And I think it's a, it's a real shame because we know from the market research that's been done, that there's demand, people are interested. Um, so there's there's more that we all need to do to to work on to, to grow and scale this. But I'm, overall, I'd say I'm I'm positive. Yeah, I, I'd say the same thing. Like when you look at the work that Jaleesa's doing, Jaleesa Brown, the executive director of TIP, yeah. and Graham and Tristan and Christelle and so many others. And I, I, I'm not sure if you know, I'm the board president of Sednet and Mike Toy and the team at Sednet is doing remarkable work. There are so many actors. Um, so I think that's part of how we um, do this work by amplifying the work on the ground internationally, especially because if folks are still so risk adverse, but want to invest in crypto, but not in emerging markets. And when we say emerging markets, we're usually talking about Africa or at least the global South. Um, I, I think there is a, almost a dissonance, you know? So we, we, we have to find ways and means to amplify the great work happening um, globally to ensure that we can create these products and flow capital in more equitable ways. So thank you so much. So my last question to you is, do you have any closing thoughts or call to actions to our listeners and viewers? Um, I think uh, for, for the listeners, certainly, you know, looking forward to continued collaboration and, and let's all find a way to, to, to work together on some common, common challenges. I think for the broader financial sector, my call to action would be just to uh, be open to new ideas and new things. There's a lot happening out there, but I find we're maybe a little bit too much in our own bubble. And so open your eyes and, and see some of the opportunities. I mean, you know, we have uh, at Mita, we're invested in the Women's World Banking has two funds focused on, uh, you know, gender smart uh, financial services. And a lot of them are fintechs and ag techs. And, you know, we've got really strong impact figures, but we've also got very strong return figures. So there are opportunities out there. Um, so I I just love to see people being a bit more um nuanced and reflective rather than saying oh well the credit the risk is too high I can't do it there you know it's where do, how do you 
um, just take a different look. Because I think, you know, we know biases and perceptions don't do any of us any good. So, you know, how do you take an open mind and, and find those opportunities? Um, yeah, and those were those were my, my main thoughts. I just want to thank you so much, Victor, for giving me the opportunity and the time and also for your leadership and your partnership and all the, the work that we've been doing together. Um, you know, look forward to continued collaboration. Indeed, indeed. Thank you so much, Lindsay. And we'll close the way we began this interview by giving thanks to our creator, by acknowledging the original stewards of the various lands we're on. We acknowledge all our ancestors. We acknowledge all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We acknowledge all our elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. Thank you so much, Lindsay. We so appreciate you.